Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries with John and Hannah. Hi. This is the second of our two-part episode talking about the monk in D&D. I think one of the reasons that I'm not particularly fond of the monk as a class in D&D is because I don't see them as offering a great deal beyond the basic fighter. Because all of the classes in D&D, they're sort of broad reaching archetypes that cover a lot of things. So if you want to play a ranger, there's numerous different characters you can play under that umbrella of that class. Now for me, I, when I sort of first got into D&D, I was like, right, there's the fighter, he's fighty, hence the name. Then there's the cleric, who's like the religious healy person. So I didn't see the need for another fighter who's basically, I'm a fighter, but I don't fight with a weapon. I didn't really see that there was like a particular niche for that. And the the monk class in itself also seems to just do a lot of the stuff that other classes do, only with some other stuff on top. Now, you know I love the bard class. Yes, I'm aware of this. Because the bard class has a little bit of the cleric class, a little bit of the thief class, a little bit of the mage class. All of those three sort of jam together, give you a bard. I often think that the monk is the other sort of mix character, if you want. Yeah. And I know you've got your druid and you've got your ranger who are sort of a fightier version of the priest and a priestier version of the fighter, almost. But the monk sort of fills the niche between wizard and fighter in a different way or rather between psionicist and fighter and I think it depends a lot on whether you're going to have a lot of psionics in your game I can see them being quite an important character class if you are yeah I mean I think for me I mean I think there's it depends on where you draw the line I mean I think there's a certain amount of like niche protection at play in D&D because if you've got the fighter class which is good at fighting but then you've got, say, half a dozen other classes which are equally as good at fighting, but they also get other stuff. Why would anyone play a fighter? And I think it just depends on where you draw that line, because I think if you wanted to be like particularly sort of hardcore about it, you could go, there's no need for a druid, just make it like a particular type of cleric. Oh, there's no need for a bard, just make it a particular type of thief or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I do think with some of those classes... Like, like the bard, it's not just a thief. You get a couple of the thief abilities, but you also get like the bardic music and stuff like that. And with the druid, again, their powers, although they're sort of a bit like a cleric's, the lower level stuff, like you can do a little bit of healing, but you're not as good as a cleric. So the cleric's still protected in its sort of like little niche, but then you've also got like the animal summoning and the nature powers. So that makes it quite different. Whereas to me... The monk, for all that, like you can do all these fantastic, like key abilities and flurries of blows and stuff. It all basically comes down to like, you are good at combat. That's the end result. Mm-hmm. It's like it might work differently if you're a fighter. You just rock up with your broadsword, roll them d20s, and hack away. If you're a monk, you might spend your key points and go, oh, "I'm going to do a flurry of blows. I'm going to like touch a death or whatever it is this person over here and like explode the head or whatever." But the end result is basically, you are good at combat. Now. I think that worked in earlier versions of D&D where it was almost understood that like because these classes had such ridiculously high prerequisites it was like nine times out of ten you weren't going to have good enough stats to play a monk so you wouldn't be playing a monk you'd be playing a fighter or something but then that one time out of ten when you got those stats you'd be like oh it's monk time and you'd be in for playing that character. Whereas I think sort of as we go later on in D&D, and we'll talk about this a bit more in like when we get to 4th Ed and 5th Ed, because they don't have those prerequisites, that there's, they seem to be taking away more from the core classes. Because let's say you're playing in 5th edition, I can't think of a reason why I'd want to play a normal fighter, aside from roleplay reasons, mm-hmm. over a monk. Because a monk can pretty much do all the stuff a fighter can do, and they get a few thief abilities thrown in, and they get all these extra monk abilities thrown in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, okay, at low levels, I might not be quite as good at fighting as, like, a normal fighter, but as soon as I get a couple of levels under my belt and I'm, like, flurry of blows in people and just sort of, like, wading in with, like, a few of, like, the sort of weapons a monk can use, 
I don't see why you'd want to play a normal fighter. So, what's apart from that? Is there anything else in fourth ed that's significantly different from third ed? Okay, so let me just have a look at the player's handbook three: psionic, divine, and primal heroes for fourth edition. Okay, so as we know, in fourth edition, each class was given a role, which because there was a more of a tactical element in fourth edition, yeah, it was yeah. more built for miniatures play. So each class had like a role, what they're supposed to do on the, the battlefield, and they had a power source which described where their powers came from. So the monk's role is a striker. You typically eschew weapons in favour of unarmed attacks, and you avoid armour in favour of manoeuvrability and agility. So zipping around the battlefield licking out damage with various different forms of attack so moving in hitting hard moving out again their power source is described as psionic so again rolling that sort of key points into psionic powers your intense focus constant training and exceptional talent combined to allow you to harness the psionic power within yourself um, you get armor proficiencies cloth you can use clubs daggers unarmed strikes quarter staff shurikens slings and spears you get Key focus. Let's see what sort of special abilities they get. So basically, you can choose which sort of like monastic tradition you want to follow. There's centered breath or stone fist, which dis describe what abilities you get. Centered breath gives you a flurry of blows, and mental equilibrium, which gives you plus one bonuses to fortitude, and that goes up to plus two at eleventh level, plus three at twenty-first level. Or Stone Fist gives you Flurry of Blows and Mental Bastion, which gives you bonuses to will save. So they're pretty similar. And the, the Monk Overview, which is one thing I liked in Fourth Ed, it gives you like a little tiny overview here. Mm -hmm. And it says, the Overview, you have powers that combine movement with powerful strikes. Dart in and out of the battle without risking attacks of opportunity from your foes. Compared to other strikers, you're better at taking on small groups of enemies. You hit it, you move in, hit, move out, and fade away before they can respond. And in terms of the powers they have, obviously I'm not going to go into like all of the powers here because there are a lot of them in 4th edition. But just a few of them from the sort of like first level ones. The centred flurry of blows, you hit with an attack during your turn. And as you go up in level, you can target more creatures. The targets take damage equal to two plus your wisdom modifier. When you hit someone, you can slide them a square to any square adjacent to you. So you can push people around the battlefield and like maneuver them. The, the stone fist flurry of blows does more damage, but it doesn't allow you to move people around. So that's the difference between the two types of monasteries. Do you want to have more control over where people are positioned or are you just going for the stone fist like raw damage? In terms of at will powers, you can get Crane's Wings, where you can make an athletics check to jump with a plus five power bonus. You are considered to have a running start, even if you just stood there. The distance of your jump is not limited by your speed. There's Dancing Cobra, which is an attack power, which also allows you to move at your speed plus two. And there's Dragon's Tail, where you can use it at will. You can knock a target prone when you hit them, and also you can swap places with the targets. You sort of pull them into where you were and switch places with them again. So again, a lot of these powers are based around sort of taking control of the battlefield and changing people's positioning. So it looks more like, to me, more like a sort of support character. So you can do the damage, but the real benefit to a monk in 4th edition, to me, would be you can zip onto the battlefield, avoid them attacks of opportunity, which can be quite dangerous in 4th edition. Mm -hmm. And also, you can be you can rearrange other people. So when your friends, your allies, get to move, you can have made sure that like people are in the best position. So if you're like, right, we need to go through that, that place there, but we're going to take four attacks of opportunity, if the monk can nip in and be like... Tch, tch, all right, those people are no longer within range of an attack of opportunity. All your mates can move through. So that's it. I, 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 the, the monk in 4th edition does actually seem pretty cool to me. I mean, like I say, 4th edition is a bit more of a sort of tactical sort of miniatures vibe, but it at least feels to me like they're not just a fighter in 4th edition. They are a fighter, but they've got very distinct powers from like an actual fighter, which gives them a different role in battle rather than just being like, I don't use weapons, but I still do damage. I don't know. Fourth Ed. All I remember of Fourth Ed was the endless, endless combats. 
Yeah. I'm not sure whether that was the game we were playing or the nature of the system. I think perhaps a little of both. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, I think certainly the combats tend to be more involved in 4th edition because of the more tactical element, but I think that's probably a topic for another day. Uh, so what about in 5th, Ed? Okay, so the monk class in 5th, Ed, again, it mentions the magic of key, so we're going back to that whole sort of psionic power points vibe, and we can see if we look at the little uh, advancement chart, you don't get any key points at first level, you get two at second level, and it keeps going up and up until you get to like 20 key points at 20th level. You get D8 hit dice, as per previous, you can use pretty much the same types of weapons. Your best saving throws are strength and dexterity. You get to pick two skills from acrobatics, athletics, history, insight, religion, and stealth. You get a fairly spartan selection of equipment. Um, beginning at first level, while you're wearing no armor and not wearing a shield, your AC is equal to 10, plus your dex, plus your wisdom. So you actually get like a bit of a boost in your armor class. At first level, your practice of martial arts gives you a mastery of combat styles using unarmed strikes, which basically means you can, you can, while you're not wearing armor and you're, wield, you're not wielding a weapon, you can use dex instead of strength for attack and damage rolls. You can roll d4 in place of the normal damage of your unarmed strike, which I think normally unarmed strikes are one point of damage or something. So a little bit more than that. When you use the attack action with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon, you can make one un unarmed strike as a bonus action. So, for example, if you take the attack action, attack with the quarter staff, you can then also make an unarmed strike as a bonus action. So, doubling your attacks effectively, which is obviously pretty handy. Once you get to second level, you start getting the key points, and you can spend those points to fuel various powers like Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, Step of the Wind. Flurry of Blows, immediately after you've made an attack, you can spend a key point to make two unarmed strikes. So straight away there you can attack, spend a key point, do another two unarmed strikes. Patient defense, you can spend a key point to take a dodge as a bonus action, so even if you've already acted, throw a key point down, we're having to dodge this. Step of the wind, you spend one key point to make a disengage or a dash action as a bonus. So again, increasing your movement. And starting at second level, as long as you're not wearing armor, your speed increases by 10 feet and it moves up more. And at ninth level, you gain the ability to move across vertical surfaces and across liquids on your turn without without falling, as long as you don't like stop your move on the liquid. So that's that's really like the wire foo thing where you see someone like running across the surface of the water, no doubt with their hands held out behind them as they <laughs> and their head leaning forward as they run. As is the way with fifth ed, once you get to third level, you select like the path that your hero's going to follow, which determines your abilities. So it's your monastic tradition in this. And there is the way of the open hand, the way of the shadow, or the way of the four elements. And I think some more of those are introduced in other books. You still are getting abilities like being able to deflect missiles at third level. And then you get various other abilities which may or may not be powered by key points related to your monastic tradition. So for instance, the way of the open hand, you get the open hand technique. So starting when you choose that tradition at third level, you can manipulate your enemy's key when you harness your own. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by flurry of blows, you can impose one of the following effects on the target. They've either got to make a deck save or fall prone. They've got to make a strength save. And if they fail, you can push them 15 feet away from you, or they can't take any reactions until the end of your next turn. So again, this seems like it's trying to fold in the sort of battlefield manoeuvring that was mm -hmm. present in 4th edition, although obviously with a, a slightly less sort of tactical sort of board mm -hmm. game element here. And I like the fact there's different monastic traditions that you can follow. So the way of the shadow is more your sort of ninja -y, sort of thiefy like stealth sort of thing. And you get things like mm -hmm. at six level, the old shadow step, you know, you step into one shadow, you come out of another shadow within range, that sort of stuff. And then we have the way of the four elements where you sort of your focus your key and this is where you sort of last airbender sort of stuff where you can like cast some elemental spells you can avoid the harmful effects of various elements stuff like that or a lot of which costs you various key points so in effect if you take that it becomes like spells but a spell point system instead of the traditional fancy and magic 
So something that you mentioned there, looking at the uh, fifth ed one. Yeah. Uh, that I remember back in the day being something that caused some arguments. Okay. As far as monks went with like my high school D and D group. Uh, monks not being allowed to carry, use armor weapons of certain types and I think it varies a little bit across all five editions. Yes it does yeah yeah. A couple of 14 year olds arguing about D&D rules it's not important really but the argument went something like oh uh, we're trying to get into this castle we're going to disguise ourselves as the castle guards oh, right. that character can't disguise himself as a castle guard because it would mean he'd have to wear armour and carry a weapon and he's a monk and he can't do that and debate going round and round and yeah, round yeah. now obviously now as an experienced GM I would turn around and say well don't be daft he's not actually using the armour yeah, or the it, weapon it, he's wearing it so as a it's disguise. irrelevant as the yeah. stats go apart from th- for the disguise a GM would also be fair to say, oh, well, can you think of another way to disguise that character? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I entirely agree with you. I mean, obviously, it, it's a matter of intent as far as I'm concerned. Because if the person was like, oh, I'm just going to try and wear some armour and a bit, few bits and pieces like that to give my monk like a boost and somehow sort of like get round the fat monks can't use them, I'd be like, no, not really. But when the intent of it isn't to like make them more heavily armoured, it's to get them into that castle... I would probably say now, and let you say this is different, obviously we now we're more experienced as GMs, I would say, yeah, you can wear that armour for a disguise, but I would say like the instant you want to do any of your, like, your monkey shenanigans, you're going to have to throw that off. But that could work as well. So now how many films have you seen where they're, like, they're sneaking through the gates, something goes wrong, they throw off the disguise, and then like stuff gets real basically so i would say like the instant you want to do any of your like monk abilities or anything like that you're gonna have to throw off this disguise and i wouldn't mm-hmm. penalize them by saying oh bad times you've put on armor it's gonna take you like three turns to like take that mm-hmm. armor off i'd just be like no you've got him with the disguise you throw your cloak and the armor off revealing like your monk robes underneath you're there in like your kung fu stance you're good to go and i think that could be like a really cool scene but as I said, I would just say you can't use any of your sort of your powers until you've divested yourself of that armor. Because you could also have the thing where, like the the stereotypical scene out of a film where, like, they've been sort of like I don't know, maybe taking a few blows, but they're still keeping the disguise on, and they're just like because they're trying to like mm-hmm. keep the disguise on. Then one of the enemy sort of hits them and like knocks their armor off or knocks the hood off, and they see the monk robes underneath, and that's when they like drop into the stance and like things start to get real. Have you ever played a monk as a player character? I have, yeah, not very often. Um, I've played, I think I played a monk a couple of times in th- version 3 or 3.5. And to be fair, they're all right. I'm still not a mad fan of the class. Um, if I was going to play like a fighty class, I'd rather just play a normal fighter. Um, that's Again, that's just personal preference on my behalf. Um, and I think that's partly because I do like the sort of the idea of like the monk as like the monastic sort of... I suppose Western style of monk, as opposed to like the waifu kung fu. Now, don't get me wrong, I love like a waifu like kung fu film all day, every day. Not a problem with that. Shaolin monk it up to your heart's content. However, for me, when you've got everything else in a game that seems to be sort of based very much on Western tropes, then you suddenly inject like a monk who's obviously Eastern influenced into it. It seems an odd juxtaposition to me. I'm not saying it can't work because it's a fantasy game, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it always felt to me like you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna have monks in a game, like, sort of Eastern style monks, there's a lot of other stuff in those those kung fu films that I love, and I love them as much as anyone. I mean, maybe not as much as Jason because he loves his kung fu films, <laughs> but I love my kung fu films, and. There's so much other stuff as well as monks in them that I always feel that like well, there's a few Eastern monsters in the Monster Man. The, the, there are a few. There are, but it always feels to me like it's sort of like a bit of an afterthought or a bit of like a side thing. And I think well, if you're going to have monks in it in a game, surely all of the other concepts from those films should be given an equal treatment. So if, let's say, and I know they did this in some of the complete books for like Second Ed D and D. So. 
And I suppose you could reskin some of the other classes. Because if, like, someone said to me, oh, I want to play a, I want to play a samurai in a game, just to use a ridiculously stereotypical example, and I'm like, there's no samurai class, mate. And they're like, oh, but they've got monks. I don't have a good reason to disallow that. And I know that in some of the editions, like say in AD and D Second Ed, the the complete fighters handbook had like a samurai subclass in. I believe it's the Paladin handbook actually, but yeah. Yeah, I know Third Edition had a version of Oriental Adventures. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that was the First Edition Oriental Adventures, and I believe there's possibly in Fifth Edition or Third Edition there's like a variant fighter which is a samurai. I'm not sure, but it just seems to me like if you're going to like um, no, so I'm not explaining this very well, but let me give an example. Um, I'm sure you're aware of like old school essentials, which is the game I'm running at the minute, and that's pretty much a faithful translation of basic Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. Then they've done some optional books, which is like here's some classes that weren't in basic D and D, but they're in AD and D, but we've sort of reworked them so they're more the power level of basic D and D. Now the author of that. Gavin Norman has deliberately not included monks in it and he was asked about this and I was one of the people who asked him about it so I was like oh what's going on with this because they're, they're in all d and and he said well what I want to do is I wouldn't want to include them until I get round to doing a book which can give them and the various sort of other eastern fantasy tropes decent coverage rather than just sort of shoehorning them in as an afterthought and that's something I very much agree with now, being from not too far from Nottingham, yeah. in fact, living in a town, growing up in a town, that was founded by monks, Yes. I quite like the idea of having some beer-brewing, head-shaving... Yeah, boy! Uh, what's the word? Choral singing. That's it, catfowl. <laughs> who are still badass enough to be able to defend their church, their monastery, their brewery, the town around it. Well, it's, it's funny you should mention that, because I uh, I was lucky enough to be included in like, the playtest group for the Dolmenwood campaign book mm -hmm. that Gavin Norman's bringing out. And inside that, I won't go into too much detail, because obviously I want to encourage you to go out and buy the book. <laughs> and I, I, I trust anybody looking to buy a copy when it comes out. But... In the, the player's book for Dolman Wood, they have a class called the Friar, mm. which is very much that sort of... Well, it describes it as a wandering monastic who spreads the gospel of God, which is very much that sort of cadfile, sort of a Cistercian monk sort of style vibe. And you get prime requisite wisdom. You can use a small subset of weapon, your clubs, daggers, whatever, staffs, etc. And with that, you get... Again, you get a bit of extra armour class. It's your armour of faith. You can use divine magic a bit. You're good at foraging for herbs. You have an increased chance because you're like, you're like the sort of person who... The way the way I've sort of pictured it is in this is like the priests are like the sort of big sort of like orthodox like members of the church, whereas your monk is like the local wise man, the person who goes around like helping the poor people of the village and stuff like that. You gain the ability to like use herbs and like stretch them out and do more benefits for that. And you get you can turn undead, but not as good as a cleric. So again, you do a few things a cleric can do, but not quite as well. So you're not taking away from the clerics. But you also get a few other little bits and pieces thrown in there. You have a, a vow of poverty, so you can only keep wealth and um, possessions that you can carry personally. You can't be like, oh well, I've got sacks of gold back at my shack. You have to like donate it to help out the poor, which I quite like. And after reaching ninth level, as with most characters in like basic D and D, where like, fighters can build fortresses, you can found your own monastery after you reach ninth level, and you'll attract other friars and people like that to come and worship at that monastery. And I really love that because that's just like a, a, a double page spread. And for me, it entirely, with, with only like a fair few tweaks, it really encapsulates that sort of idea of like the Western sort of monk for me. And I personally prefer that to the Eastern Monk. So how was he for combat, sorry? So in combat, not particularly any great shakes, to be honest. I mean, you your um, base attack bonus is zero up until like fifth level. Then it's plus two for another four levels, plus five for another four levels, then like 
plus seven at thirteenth and fourteenth level. So, whereas in the D and D books we've been looking at, the monk tends to be a sort of a cross between like paladin, psionicist, thief. In this, it's more of a druid, cleric. Well, I, I don't, I don't know that it is. In this, it's like a mix of like clerical abilities, like lesser clerical abilities, then the. The, the foraging and the herbalism stuff isn't really based on druids because in like basic D&D anyone can forage in the yeah. sort of Dolmwood campaign anyone can look for herbs but your chance is low all they get is like a bit of a Brucey bonus mm -hmm. because they have local knowledge it's a bit more likely but that doesn't go up drastically with levels it's just you, you're a bit better at it than normal people it's not like it's, it's not as ridiculous ability as, you know, like you're somersaulting over, you're not four attacks in a round and whatever, you're catching arrows out of the air. It's just like you're a bit good at, like, getting herbs. <laughs> you're a bit good mm -hmm. at foraging. That's pretty much the only the only major thing that you get. One thing I do like, which I'm sure has been just been put in for a bit of a nod and wink, is a fryer can employ a frying pan, cured sausage, or even a ham shank as an improvised club which is like their culinary implements in the combat thing. And obviously the, the sort of dolman wood is like a tongue in cheek, sort of almost like Black Adder esque sort of fairy tale sort yeah. of setting. So I really do like that. It, it's not, And it fits with like the older sort of version of the India, where it was a bit more tongue in cheek, a bit more sort of humorful, it didn't take itself quite so seriously. And I really love that about the, the Friar class. I can't wait to see like the final book, you know, see what it's going to be like. And I'm, strongly considering because there isn't a monk class for for old school essentials at the minute i'm strongly considering just like allowing the friar class into like any of my old school essentials games because i think it doesn't take away from the cleric so we're still with that niche protection thing covered but it just gives you like a little bit of healing a little bit of turning and then you get like a couple of other little things like collecting herbs and stuff like that which i think is really nice and cool it's flavorful it doesn't break the game it's just a nice sort of a nice sort of rounded class in my opinion so any conclusions well i think for myself i think the the monk as it was originally presented where it had like the the sort of difficult to reach prerequisites made sense because it was something you only got the opportunity to play occasionally whereas now it's been brought more into like a core class that's very easy to play i think it's lost some of its uniqueness and the specialness that made it interesting in like further first edition D, D. you can reskin it to bring it more into your world but for me personally if you're going to be using those sort of like that eastern mythology i'd like to see it developed more rather than just being like slipped in at the last minute with a load of like western tropes mm -hmm. so that's our ramblings about the monk class in D, D. we hope you've enjoyed these episodes if you've got any queries or questions or maybe you want to tell us what you think about the monk you can leave us a voicemail message using the speak pipe website there'll be a link in the description of this show or you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com until we see you next time take care stay safe and keep gaming bye so i've just looked at that timer this is going to be a double episode now, isn't it? Well, Hand Leaks, we're only recording like two episodes a week now. We don't have to worry about it so much. Oh, right, that's cool. But yeah, we can split it down into two episodes. <laughs> so. I'll call the second one Return of the Monk. <laughs> Return of the Monk. <laughs> so. Once again. I love you. I love you. <laughs> so. Return of the Monk. <laughs> no. So I was just being silly, Karen. No, it's fine. You, you keep uh, singing your sing song. Okay.